Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matthew Rice. I'm the Scotland Director for Open Rights Group, and thank you all very much for joining us uh, on this really exciting panel discussion uh, combining uh, Scotland's AI strategy and uh, an exclusive look at the new um, documentary, I Human. So for those of you who are not familiar with us, Open Rights Group are a, a digital rights campaigning organisation focusing across the United Kingdom with um, grassroots membership uh, base. So we've got folks in London and um, Manchester, Newcastle, and importantly for this conversation um, in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen. Um, and we work to safeguard um, your, your rights online. We work on the challenges that technology brings and try to foster better uh, solutions that protect uh, fundamental human rights. So um, we're here today for a panel discussion on the role of artificial intelligence in our lives and what Scotland is currently doing to respond to it. We're joined by a host of fantastic panelists with varied backgrounds from business, law, ethics, and philosophy. Alongside this discussion, we're gonna be showing exclusive clips from the new documentary, I Human, and joined by the film's director. This part is all made possible by our co-organizers, Think Film Impact, and their Global Impact Director, Amy Shepherd, who I'll hand over to now. Thank you, Matthew. Um, it's a real honor to be here and to be joining you today. Um, as Think Film Impact Production, we believe that storytelling can change policy. And so that is um, that sits behind everything that we do. And we've really seen this with iHuman. We have seen how this film has entered into policy discussions at the highest arenas. We've brought the film to the OECD and to the Council of Europe. And we're really, really pleased to be discussing how it can impact a national approach to AI. Uh, so we, I'm also happy to welcome our esteemed panel and um, we'll introduce them further. Um, we would also like to engage you and your our wonderful audience. Um, we know you all have views and perspectives on this topic. You know, AI is something that impacts all of us every day. And so please do let us know what you think. Do send questions to our panel. Do engage with our polls um, on Slido with hashtag iHuman. And without further ado, let's see the, the trailer and then you can hear from the director herself. One moment, got to find all the different points. Here we are. is gone. We as humanity are about to go into a very dark time. Cyber attacks, fake news, totally automated AI weapons. AI is going to be the most important technology in the history of the planet. Will humans actually benefit? Think carefully about this. We're basically building a god. What we are seeing now is like a train hurtling down a dark tunnel. And it looks like we are sleeping at the wheel. I hope that came through um, clearly to everyone. Um, it is my pleasure now then to welcome um, the director, Tonya Hessenshai. She is an award-winning um, Norwegian documentary filmmaker. She's been working with independent documentary since 1996. And after spending five years and more than 80 interviews with the pioneers on the front lines of the AI revolution, she has brought together this wonderful film that really um, goes deep inside the industry. And so, um, I'll let her tell us a little bit more. Tonya, tell us about your vision for the film, how this came about and, and what the process of making it's been like. 
Well, thank you so much, Amy, and thank you to this wonderful panel. Uh, and I couldn't be more thrilled to spotlight some of the issues that we are facing uh, with artificial intelligence uh, also in Scotland today. So I have in my work mostly been um, kind of driven by huge international issues. And for the last 15 years, I've been increasingly uh, taken by the very exciting and terrifying and rapidly changing relationship that we humans have to technology. And in 2014, when I was working on my last film, Drone, uh, one of the things, or, you know, Drone was a film uh, about CIA's secret drone warfare. And one of the things that became increasingly uh, concerning to me while I was working on Drone uh, was to see how the weapons were becoming more and more autonomous. And when I started looking into the technology behind these weapons, I realized that artificial intelligence not only is changing modern warfare, but pretty much everything around us. This was in 2014. And back then, nobody really talked about artificial intelligence. And this technology somehow was just creeping into our everyday lives uh, and into our societies without us understanding how it is developed and how it is being implemented in our lives. Since 2014, uh, we have been in the middle of what some are calling the new big bang. And this technology is developing so fast. Uh, and we, we are really facing uh, the most powerful, far-reaching and disruptive technology of our times. And today, artificial intelligence is everywhere and we are increasingly addictive to more and more intelligent machines. That is changing what it means to be human. It is changing the fabric of our society and it is definitely changing our future. And we are still not seeing the proper global debate about the ethical challenges that we are facing with this technology. Um, so, so that's why I'm so thrilled to have this debate. I'm also really, really excited to see how the EU is becoming sort of a pioneer uh, in taking on uh, human rights uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence regulations internationally, which is so much needed. Um, yeah, I think that's a good sort of uh, intro to uh, to the background of the idea of iHuman. Brilliant. I mean, ex that's exactly what we want with iHuman. That's what you've been, you and I have been working together on is, is bringing debates together and getting people to, to think more critically and to talk more about this technology and what it is and who's in charge and what it's doing to us. Um, and so that leads me then into the, the first stage of our panel discussion today. Um, and uh, before we move into that, we've got uh, another clip from iHuman to show you that will set the frame for, for the discussion that we're about to have. So, uh, Matthew, will you cue our clip, please? Artificial intelligence is simply non-biological intelligence. And intelligence itself is simply the ability to accomplish goals. I'm convinced that AI will ultimately be either the best thing ever to happen to humanity or the worst thing ever to happen. We can use it to solve all of today's and tomorrow's greatest problems. Cure diseases, deal with climate change, lift everybody out of poverty. But we could use exactly the same technology to create a brutal global dictatorship with unprecedented surveillance and inequality and suffering. That's why this is the most important conversation of our time. Artificial intelligence is everywhere because we now have thinking machines. If you go on social media or online, there's an artificial intelligence engine that decides what to recommend. If you go on Facebook and you're just scrolling through your friend's post, there's an artificial intelligence engine that's picking which one to show you first and which one to bury. If you try to get insurance, there's an AI engine trying to figure out how risky you are. 
And if you apply for a job, it's quite possible that an AI engine looks at the resume. We are made of data. Every one of us is made of data. In terms of how we behave, how we talk, how we love, what we do every day. So computer scientists are developing deep learning algorithms that can learn to identify, classify, and predict patterns within massive amounts of data. We are facing a form of precision surveillance. You could call it algorithmic surveillance. And it means that you cannot go unrecognized. You are always under the watch of algorithms. Almost all the AI development on the planet today is done by a handful of big technology companies or by a few large governments. If we look at what AI is you could mostly call it being algorithm. developed for, I would say it's uh, killing, spying, and brainwashing. So, I mean, we have military AI. We have a whole surveillance apparatus being built using AI by major governments. And we have an advertising industry, which is oriented toward recognizing what ads to try to, to sell to someone. We humans have come to a fork in the road now. The AI we have today is very narrow. The holy grail of AI research ever since the beginning is to make AI that can do everything better than us. We've basically built a god. It's going to revolutionize life as we know it. It's incredibly important to take a step back and think carefully about this. What sort of society do we want? And so to begin answering that question from that uh, deliriously spooky clip in some areas, uh, we have a fantastic panelist and um, made up of uh, some fantastic speakers. So um, introducing everyone, we have um, Professor Karen Jung. Uh, Karen Jung is an interdisciplinary professorial fellow in law, ethics, and informatics at the University of Birmingham. Her work is concerned with examining social, legal, democratic, and ethical implications of technological development, and is a former member of the EU's high-level expert group on artificial intelligence, and is actively engaged in promoting informed, inclusive, and human-centered policymaking and implementation. Gillian Daugherty, OBE, is chief executive of the Data Lab, an innovation center with a mission of maximizing the value for Scotland from data that facilitates partnerships between industry and academia, supporting data science and artificial intelligence. Gillian comes from a computer science background, formerly by IBM. She's a visiting professor at Robert Gordon University and is passionate about the opportunity for using data to derive economic and social benefits. And Shannon Valor is the Bailey Gifford Chair in the Ethics of Data and Artificial Intelligence at the Edinburgh Futures Institute. Professor Valor's research explores how new technologies, especially AI, robotics, and data science reshape human moral character, habits, and practices. Her work includes advising policymakers and industry on the ethical design and use of AI. A former visiting researcher and AI ethicist at Google, she is the author of the book, Technology and the Virtues, a Philosophical Guide to a Future Worth Wanting. I don't know if Shannon has yet joined us. Uh, she's currently wrapping up uh, another meeting, but... Um, I'm here. Hopefully she'll... Yeah, Shannon's here. Right, cool. That That's me gone from being a cool moderator to then just exclaiming, yeah, so I apologize. Now I'm going to hand over to Amy to go back to being the cool moderator um, and um, yeah, lead you through the first, first session of discussion here. I'll do my very best. Um, a very, very warm welcome to you all. It's, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Um, so yeah, so this question that Max Tegmark poses, what sort of world do we want? Um, so Tonya, I'll come to you first. So, you know, through the course of Making Our Human, you interviewed all sorts of different people that are working in this industry, working to build the technology, working to make the technology better and working in many ways to, um, to shape our world, even when we don't see it or don't know it. And so um, 
you know, actually in many cases, the power concentration is in the hands of a very few individuals. And so thinking about that then, who who is really making, um, who is who is making these choices about our society and who should be making these choices about what kind of ethical, trustworthy AI world that we should be living in? Yeah, I think that's a, it's a great place to start, Amy. Um, right now, today, uh, we are in a place where we have pretty much left technology to technologists. And we are seeing a power concentration in today's world that is unprecedented. Uh, the tech giants um, often have more power and more money they spend on AI than entire nations do. And one of the things that really provoked and also scared me while I was working on a human was to see what kind of power these tech companies have. Uh, in today's world, they are pretty much operating like uh, an enormous mafia with unlimited amount of money, uh, pretty much no transparency and no accountability of how they are developing and implementing it, AI in our lives. And they are barely operating with any um, international regulations. So in, in this situation, we pretty much have a few companies that are run by very few young, white, really, really rich men, or should we say boys in some instances. Um, and these, these men have, pre have grown up behind their computer screens and have a very limited uh, worldview and life experiences. Uh, and they are making decisions that affect most of humanity. So that's put very simply. So we have a tremendous job ahead of us. Uh, I personally am a big fan of democracy. I'm a big fan of diverse voices, uh, also programming in the codes uh, into the AI systems that, you know, should be examples of, of how we should, uh, or what kind of society we should make. Uh, so I really think it is high time that we, the people, uh, demand to have our voices heard and also put pressure on our international bodies and governments to get some, some international governance for this technology. Uh, so here EU I think is doing a great job. I also hope that you know United Nations uh, will help uh, establish some of these um, guidelines uh, because as ethical guidelines are not enough. I mean we need regulations and international regulations where collaboration leads the way rather than uh, competition and market forces. Well, I think that issue of international regulation is absolutely key. I mean, we're here to talk about a national policy, but also, you know, you can't set any national policy outside of, a, of an international corporation framework. Um, so perhaps, Shannon, can I take this question to you next then in terms of thinking about these international regulations? You know, the pace of technology is moving on so rapidly um, and it's almost like regulators are, are, are just struggling to, to scrabble to keep up and in many ways regulating for things that might have already been passed long ago in terms of in terms of the way that the technology has moved on. So, uh, you know, what what can what can we say about um, international regulation? Are current mechanisms enough? Are, are more needed? Um, is there a, is there sufficient enforcement of regulation? Uh, what what would you say? Um, what was your perspective on these things? Sure. Uh, well, I, I think we know that uh, we don't have um, the right regulation or enough regulation or enough enforceable regulation um, to manage. Um, the, the heavy responsibilities that come from developing these kinds of uh, technologies and deploying them at scale in society. So we know there's a regulatory gap. Um, the, the question is what kind of regulation and what instruments of regulation are, are best suited to filling that gap? And you've pointed out uh, several of the big problems. Uh, one is that you know, the kinds of regulation we're used to developing typically move very slowly. Um, and, and typically don't cross borders um, easily. And, and these are problems that are going to be amplified with AI because, ampli uh, because AI uh, does cross uh, borders and will cross borders in its effects um, and its implementations. Uh, and it will do so in ways that will change rapidly. So 
there's lots of discussion about what kinds of regulatory instruments might uh, be able to adapt more quickly um, to, to what we're seeing. Uh, what we're in right now is a moment where, as you've pointed out, a lot of our regulations are looking backwards at harms that are already unfolding, uh, for example, around uh, privacy violations, around uh, um, digital discrimination and surveillance. Um, and one of the challenges there is thinking about um, how we uh, can develop regulation that will shape the use of AI in a way that's actually beneficial to people as opposed to uh, simply trying to um, contain some of the worst harms. Uh, so basically as AI rolls out, I think one of the dangerous narratives we have to guard against is this uh, what we call technological determinism. And uh, the idea that AI sort of develops into one thing as if there's only one way it's going and then we just have to adapt. This is a really dangerous narrative and it's one that I hear being uh, put forward by tech companies often to regulators because it serves the interests of tech companies for regulators to think that AI is something that develops without human choice and direction and that it's simply something that we have to allow and then adapt to passively uh, or reactively. And so, uh, you know, when I hear, I'm going to be a little provocative here, when I hear in the, in the, in the clips, you know, Max Tegmark saying AI, it's like a god, it's going to solve all our problems. No, it's not a god. It's a tool designed by specific people with specific bodies of knowledge and skill to meet problems that are still being defined by people with certain kinds of power and resources. And there's nothing about this that's godlike, nothing. It's human all the way down, and we are responsible for it all the way down. And we have to hold those people who have that power responsible. It's not going to solve all our problems. Uh, if, you, if you look at the way that people talked about AI as you know, the magic bullet for COVID uh, at the start of the pandemic, and then look at what we've done. Uh, we've, we've made some, some good progress, but AI can't make people wear masks, right? Um, the, the biggest problems we have are people problems. And the kind of AI we have today is not the kind of AI that will solve those human problems that, that still are with us. So I, I wanna just sort of remember that the rhetoric we use is really important here. Um, there was another quote in the, in the film, we are made of data. No, we're not. Data are measurements, data are labels. We're not made of measurements. We're not made of labels. Measurements are made of us. Labels are attached to us. So we need to avoid this conflation of the machine world and then ask humanity to adapt to it as opposed to remembering that this is still all the way through a human world that we're building and the machines should be adapted to our needs, not the other way around. And so that's what our regulation needs to think about is what does a world look like where datafication, digitalization is serving the needs uh, and, and, and moral um, uh, needs of humans? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, uh, I wonder if any of our panelists would like to, to pick up on that. Perhaps Gillian, if I could, you know, thinking about how AI can be a, a tool, how can it be a positive tool as well for, um, for democratic society? And, and how can we use the other tools that we have in society to, to build on frameworks that can make sure that we're harnessing the positive power of AI and not just going down this dangerous road where it's, it's manipulating us and, and shaping our society? Sure. I, as a, I think I, I couldn't agree with Shannon more. It's another tool in the toolbox. It's another thing we can use, um, but it's up to us how we use it. And I think the key word in your question there, Amy, was the democracy piece. And I think that's critical. Um, AI in the wrong hands with the wrong goals and objectives that are set by humans will potentially do um, some untold harm. Um, but democracy at its heart and an implementation of policies set by uh, people with the at the top of their priority the citizens of their country the parts of their organization you know the 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 teams they work with that really sets the tone for I think how AI be, can be used from a policy perspective in the design and implementation, I think there's probably three areas. One is, is using data science and AI to inform policy making. So the world is changing. There are a lot of complex interlinked policy measures and data science and AI could be used to, to provide policymakers with unprecedented, 
unprecedented insights. From identifying priority areas, um, co modeling complex systems and scenarios that maybe previously weren't possible, and evaluating maybe hard to measure policy outcomes. But all of that is about putting better information, more informed uh, analysis in the hands of the policymakers. It's not about the AI making the policies for us. So I think that's the first thing. I think the second area is the uh, to improve uh, provision of public services. So I think it was mentioned in the film, governments are major holders of data um, and data science and AI can be used to harness and improve the design and provision of public services. I do have a feeling though that there's a, a wave of belief that the governments are, are doing way more with the data than maybe they are, and that it's all joined up and there's a big super spy government that, that's, you know, actually the work that's been done in the last nine months just pulling together data between local authority, central government, health to address the pandemic, there was a huge amount of work to do just even a very thin, narrow layer of data integration that had to be done. Um, uh, so I think there's lots that could be done there in terms of the provision and improving the provision of public services. And probably one of the other areas is, is contributing to, to policy that governs the use of data science and AI. And that's back to, to I guess, uh, Shannon's comments around the regulatory frameworks and how we can ensure that society is being he heard and felt and their impact is being considered by policymakers and aim to ensure that the impact is as beneficial and equitable as possible. And, and so all anchors back down to that words, democracy and, and people and humans being in charge of, of what we do. Those are some really great points. Um, I'd love to come to Karen and pick up on two particular points that you mentioned there. You talked about um, interlinking policies and you talked about AI making policies. Um, and, and I think there are two really interesting things that I mean, the, the first there is that we've got lots and lots of different policy going on around AI at, an, at, at international and national levels. And, um, you know, there might be new legal instruments happening at the Council of Europe level, at the European Parliament and Commission level. Um, and there's a there's a potential that there'll be different interpretations and different standards being imposed. And how can we make sure that this policy is all cohesive and uh, rather than conflicting? And then the second point that I, uh, is really interesting is around the use of AI in policy making itself. Um, and whether for Karen or for any of our um, for anyone else on the panel, I'm I'm really interested in this question of of how we can use AI. Um, uh, almost as a, as a watchdog for AI itself. Is this possible or, or, or is this just going to lead to more problems? Can, can we harness the technology for, for sort of, you know, the, the good side of, of it? Can it be used to regulate or is it always going to be used? Uh, is it not, or is that just not possible? Um, so Karen, your thoughts on those? Sure, thank you very much for having me. Forgive me if I smile every now and then. I have a, an eight-year-old dancing in the background trying to avoid the camera and she's just told me to put my headphones on and now looking very embarrassed. So apologies if I was a little bit distracted, but now you understand why. Um, firstly, can I just say I completely agree with Shannon about the warnings she issues, about the claims and the rhetoric that have accompanied the rise of AI and all the celebratory claims about how it's going to solve all of our problems. It won't unless we're willing to direct our attention and have the political will and the skills to do it. In other words, it is human all the way down. So I think we really need to hold on to that and not pretend that the machines are going to somehow solve climate change for us. They won't unless we really direct our attention collectively towards solving climate change. So I think it's really important not to kind of palm off responsibility to the machines because that is, is really not going to solve our problem. So with that in mind, let me address the first question, which is the problem, I think, if you don't mind me describing, there's one of regulatory cosmopolitanism. So one of the things you're saying is we see lots of initiatives in various different levels in different places, um, and there's no unified, harmonised approach yet that has emerged in relation to AI. Um, and I guess I one of the things I want to caution against is there's a little bit of a danger of what we might describe as AI exceptionalism and thinking that AI poses legal challenges and regulatory challenges that we have hitherto not encountered. And actually, I think that's overstated. So we've 
had to deal as, as contemporary societies with new technologies emerging all the time, which had novel properties and novel capacities, which we're unsure about, where our social norms have not yet settled and where the real benefits and the real risks and the real damage remains to be fully understood. And yet we still as a society have to go on, we have to navigate our way through this. And in this respect, AI I don't think is exceptional. What I do think is exceptional, however, is the fact that what we do have now is a technology that is able to apply at scale across the globe instantaneously because the internet is now a global data infrastructure. And so that, that makes us actually unprecedented in terms of our experience of new technologies. But if you think about a biological virus, for example, just to use an example, that also spreads globally at scale rather fast and we can't see it. So, but just look at the damage that's reached. So in some ways it's a nice, it's a nice analogy for the question of scale of scope, speed and unknowns. And there's some really, I think, important lessons for us in thinking about um, unidentified risks and dangers that, that haven't yet crystallized. So I think we do need to have some precautionary mindset. I think it is appropriate when we're thinking about AI, certainly in critical areas like the use of AI and weaponry, I think is absolutely paramount that we should have a precautionary approach. I think if when you're thinking about um, the production of um, advertising, perhaps we can be a little bit more risk-based in our approach, depending upon the kinds of action that's potentially triggered by these systems. So having said all of that, um, I think perhaps there is scope for acquiring a, a set of minimum standards which states across the globe might agree on. And I'm really glad to see that the human rights agenda is becoming more prominent in these debates. Um, but at the same time, I think it's also important to realize that different communities have different collective norms about what they think is important and what they value. And I think it's probably pragmatically unrealistic to expect that um, China, for example, will share the views of the EU about what those baseline thresholds should be. There might be some agreement on some very, very basic baselines, if you like, but then there may well be scope for legitimate disagreement about how we want to live. So in this bit, I, I totally agree with Gillian about the importance of bringing democratic participation into the discussion to articulate much more clearly how do we collectively want to live our digital lives? And so I think that's a really important starting point. And I'm really pleased, in fact, delighted to see that the Scottish Initiative has started by thinking with, how do we want to live? What are the outcomes socially that we want to drive towards? And this is the first time I've seen an AI policy document that starts with the question of how do we want to live? Hallelujah. Instead of thinking, look at our shiny toys. Think how we're going to fix the world with our shiny toys. No, let's start, which we try to do as a family and as a community. How do we want our world to be? And then what tools, including AI and data, do we have at our disposal that can help us achieve those objectives, recognizing that our objectives will sometimes come into conflict. And sometimes there are hard choices to be made. So for example, in the debate about security following 9-11, there was this incredible push towards accepting that collecting all data was worth it because it would make us more secure. But if you believe that we need to have some freedom in a dem dem democratic society, then we have to live with some insecurity. Otherwise we have complete and totalizing surveillance. And that's a hard call, but it's a call I think we have to make and to own those choices. And again, we come back to the importance of democratic liberation. But I think one of the real challenges in the AI space is that these technologies are really quite complicated. The ecosystem is complicated. The tech firms are really powerful. So, there are real challenges in trying to open up that debate to the community more generally and to have a meaningful discussion that's not dominated by celebratory claims or dystopian claims about where the future lies. And I think there's a real challenge in moving forward, given where the current discussion is about trying to regulate iron. And we have to try and navigate our way through this difficult territory. Um, but it's really great to see a much more concrete understanding of the kind of vision we want for society starting to inform how we proceed in that terrain. Thanks. 
Yes, it's a really, really important point about opening up the discussion and bringing more voices in. And this is something, you know, I've heard many, many times um, as well. And it always comes down then to a question of how practically how do we bring more people into this discussion and also how do we bring more uh, diverse people into the tech world itself because we can have um, all sorts of focus groups and consultations and around the policy side of things but it's much much more difficult um, to break into uh, you know, the heart of the power concentrations in the tech company. So um, I really appreciate thoughts from any of our panelists. This is a question that's come up from our audience on Slido as well, that how do we democratize AI at, at the at the root of the tech build itself, not just in the policy space, but, but in the heart of the industry? Well, I'll jump in here um, as someone who uh, has uh, spent some time as a visiting researcher in uh, industry, uh, even though uh, I, I am and, and remain an academic. And, um, you know, one of the things I think, if, for those of us here who have followed uh, the um, sort of dramatic unfolding of uh, uh, Timnit uh, Jaber's uh, resig uh, being resignated from uh, Google AI, as, uh, as the word has, has been coined, um, I, I think it's not just also about how we get more voices or more diverse voices in, it's how we make sure those voices are heard. It's how uh, we make sure that that participation uh, means something. Uh, and it is not just sort of uh, an, an empty gesture of inclusion. And that's true uh, within, certainly within the tech industry where uh, diversity and inclusion has become, unfortunately, often, uh, you know, a sort of token effort that doesn't actually um, change the, the tenor of the conversation much, or if it starts to change it in a way that the organization becomes uncomfortable about, then, then that gets shut down. So we have to change that dynamic. Um, we also have to change it in the way that uh, uh, the, the, Technologists are educated. Um, that's where most of my energies go into thinking about how we train the next generation of AI researchers and data scientists to embrace this responsibility themselves, whether or not regulators are forcing them. Uh, because especially for technology that produces new risks, uh, what you want is not just uh, for researchers to uh, be responsible in handling the risks that have already been identified. You want them to be pulling up the the red flag when there's a new uh, uh, risk that no one but them sees um, because they're the closest to, to the tech. Um, but then also thinking about the voices in the community. Again, um, I, I absolutely agree with, well, with everything Karen said actually, but uh, in, I'll focus particularly on, you know, how welcome it's been to see the Scottish government's approach uh, both begin with a, a very uh, sort of meaningful question of what is the world that we want to use data and AI to help us build, um, but also having all the way through a very consultative approach that's really trying to get the voices of Scottish people uh, to chime in. Um, but again, there's still that barrier of not just having the voices come in, but having those voices stay in the conversation and actually transform and shape the outcome. That's a task that we haven't quite figured out how to, um, how, to, how, to, how to rise to. That's a challenge we haven't risen to yet uh, worldwide. But I think uh, governments like uh, Scotland's are among the best in really understanding that that is the challenge that needs to be met. Um, and so I'm, I'm very, very hopeful that we will, um, we will make progress in that regard, but, but it's a really hard problem. Great. Uh, well, I'm going to leave the floor just a little bit longer. If any of our other panelists want to pick up on anything else that was um, that was said in any of those points, or, or want to share any other reflections, I see Karen. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that. The contribution that Shannon's made on this point, I do think there's a real cultural challenge in the tech industry, um, particularly in the West, and there's a real, unfortunately, in the West, this view that um, computers and maths is for boys. And, um, you know, Barbies and hairdressing is for girls and all, all these kinds of stereotypes. And, and once you get into computer science schools, and I am in a computer science school as well as a law school, and the two cultures are completely different. The law school is dominated by women and 
far away the computer science school is dominated by men and this was not intentional again there was nothing intentional about this but it does reflect the the cultural dynamics of those particular sectors and, and once upon a time the, the um the legal profession was dominated by men and it's not the case anymore at the level of entry at the senior level i'm afraid to say it's still dominated by men but at the entry level we have a complete um flip-flop and we have more young women entering the legal profession than we do um men and we have a very diverse cohort so all of that's really encouraging to demonstrate that cultural change in industries is possible. And I think we, we're going to be playing a long game in terms of trying to transform the culture of computer science and engineering. And part of that, I suspect, is um, a, a particularly Western view. So for example, in uh, Middle and Eastern cultures, you see a lot more female computer scientists. Um, and in Asia, it's much more... Um, normal <laughs> to see women computer scientists and mathematicians it's much less common in the west which i think is problematic and may say something about our kind of cultural norms and and the power of our advertising but but quite apart from that um we also see i think in the in the the, the original culture of of a lot of the computing technology has been from a kind of hacker culture. This is part of the origins of the move fast and break things mentality that's, that has been predominant and still remains dominant in the tech industry, which is about kind of tinkering and building stuff and just putting it out there and seeing if it works. And that's fine if we're talking about computer games, but society and human lives are not games, or at least not games that other people should be playing with a will. And so there really also needs to be a change in mindset to professionalize the way in which I think that the, the industry and the professionals actually see themselves. There's, there's this view which I call, um, you know, the kind of algorithms don't harm people fallacy. And we saw this a lot with COVID, for example, there was a view that we just put out a, some kind of clever digital tool that can identify who's moving where with what. And, you know, there's no harm in it if, in it, if it doesn't work, which we know is nonsense because if it's surveilling you, there is potential harm in it. And just because it's invisible doesn't make it harmless. So I think there are at lots of levels a number of assumptions based on a, a misunderstanding of what is going on and what is at stake that really needs to be opened up for inquiry and to be challenged and to, to recognise that we're probably playing a, long, a much, much longer game to try and change the culture of the industry, the professional norms and the way in which we really want to embrace a much more responsible approach to development and implementation and post-implementation monitoring. I think it's absolutely vital that we get to that point. My worry is that the whole industry moves so quickly that we don't have a lot of time. It's really important that to start doing this now. In fact, yesterday, to be perfectly honest. Well, we're going to dive much deeper into the Scotland strategy and how Scotland can, can start doing this today. In fact, has already started um, with the strategy. But just before we move on, I want to um, just give the floor to Tonya to say a final few words there about the industry and the culture of the industry. Um, and if you saw any signs of hope from your interview um uh, from, from your experiences yeah let's let's see if we can find some hope uh well first i just want to say that i i totally agree with uh all of the main points that were brought up uh here um one of the things that that we found when we were making i human was that within the tech industry we are now starting to see uh, a bit of a change where uh, there's a movement where tech workers are starting to speak out. Uh, and in iHuman, we are featuring uh, several whistleblowers from some of the main tech companies. Um, and, and learning from them just how, you know, the, the way that the industry is built up, uh, each task is divided into tiny little pieces where you don't always know exactly what your work is contributing to or which project you're really part of. Uh, and that was something that uh, we saw people starting to, to really react to and, and wanted to know the full picture of what they were participating in and then speaking out. And in some cases, uh, losing their jobs or, or quitting because they could not stand for what was happening within the industry. Um, and that, that also kind of brings me to one of the, the key problems that I think we are facing. And that is the lack of transparency. Because before we really know 
what is being done. Uh, it is really also hard for us to uh, understand what actions to take to make sure that we are moving forward in the right direction. Uh, and so much of the AI development today is done in complete secrecy. And that is something that you know we have to work to change so that we can figure out what actions that we need to take in order to develop this uh, technology responsibly. Well, thank you. Thank you all for those very deep reflections. Um, we're going to move on to the next section of our discussion, which, as I say, hones in on Scotland and what's specifically happening with the strategy. Um, but before we do so, we have another clip of iHuman to play. So Matthew, to cue the clip. Thank you very much. Can you see this clip? A large fraction of the digital footprints we're leaving behind are digital images. And specifically, what's really interesting to me as a psychologist are digital images of our faces. Here you can see the difference in the facial outline of an average gay and average straight face. And you can see that straight men have slightly broader jaws. Gay women have slightly larger jaws compared with straight women. Computer algorithms can reveal our political views or sexual orientation or intelligence just based on the picture of our faces. Even a human brain can distinguish between gay and straight men with some accuracy. Again, now it turns out that the computer can do it with much higher accuracy. What you're seeing here is an accuracy of off-the-shelf facial recognition software. This is terrible news for gay men and women all around the world. And not only gay men and women, because the same algorithms can be used to detect other intimate traits. Think being a member of the opposition, or being a liberal, or being an atheist. Being an atheist is also punishable by death in Saudi Arabia, for instance. My mission as an academic is to warn people about the dangers of algorithms being able to reveal our intimate traits. The problem is that when people receive bad news, they very often choose to dismiss them. Well, it's a bit scary when you start receiving death threats from one day to another, and I received quite a few death threats. But as a scientist, I have to basically show what is possible. So what I'm really interested in now is to try to see whether we can predict other traits from people's faces. Now, if you can detect depression from face or suicidal thoughts, maybe a CCTV system on the train station can save some lives. What if we could predict that someone is more prone to commit a crime? You probably had a school counselor, a psychologist hired there to identify children that potentially may have some behavioral problems. So now imagine if you could predict with higher accuracy that someone is likely to commit a crime in the future from the language use, from their face, from their facial expressions, from the likes on Facebook, I'm not developing new methods, I'm just describing something or testing something in an academic environment. But there obviously is a chance that while warning people against risks of new technologies, I may also give some people new ideas. We haven't yet seen the future in terms of the ways in which the new data-driven society is going to really evolve. The tech companies want to get every possible bit of information that they can collect on everyone to facilitate business. The police and the military want to do the same thing. 
to facilitate security. The interests that the two have in common are immense. And so the extent of collaboration between what you might call the military tech complex is growing dramatically. The CIA, for a very long time, has maintained a close connection with Silicon Valley. Their venture capital firm, known as Incutel, makes seed investments to startup companies developing breakthrough technology that the CIA hopes to uh, deploy. Palantir, the big data analytics firm, one of their first seed investments was from Incutel. And so within all of this sits um, Scotland's uh, strategy. Um, and and the kind of kicks off the second part of this discussion. What we saw there was a few of the trends coming up around one, perhaps far too effective academic work from Michelle Kaczynski in, in showing um, how um, how effective AI can be in some way of showing how different we are to one another, or um, at least kind of uh, you know facet looking like that. But also asking the question of um, what are we introducing and interfacing between the public sector and the private sector? And, um, you know, Scotland's strategy, which Open Rights Group was a part of the Ethics and Regulatory Framework Working Group, and uh, Gillian's uh, Data Lab had a huge role to play in it, and Shannon was also part of the same working group that I was involved in, um, set about trying to kind of uh, answer some of those questions, not specifically about the immediate applications of AI, but, um, into the areas of what kind of society do we want to live in um, and where can AI fit into that. Um, and so with that, I want to kind of dig a little bit deeper into what we are seeing that could be of positivity and, and where we want to take some of this. And um, the thing that strikes me is that I think everybody's talked about it, at least every government in some form uh, that has that's like a major operating nation has a some form of strategy or AI ideal, um, although it, occurs to me that it hasn't necessarily yet been implemented. And the question really becomes what happens when you start putting your rules into practice or your strategy uh, hitting the road. But before we kind of come to that, um, I was wondering whether, Tonya, you talked a little bit at the end there about kind of sh seeing some glimmers of optimism and hope around how developers want to interface with, with AI. Um, but I was wondering whether you could say from your years of research, whether you saw something that kind of corrected a bias that um, uh, that sits within our society. You know, the problem that we're often faced with is that AI is presented as just a reflection of the bias that we hold ourselves or in our data sets. So, you know, racist garbage goes in and then racist garbage comes out. But is there something where you've seen someone really put their wits to the test and come out the other side with a tool that is corrective in some form um, and, and used in a kind of a more effective way? Yeah, I wish I wish I had a, a more hopeful answer <laughs> to you. But um, during during the, the research of the film, I uh, did not find um, a substantial hopeful solution to uh, to bias. Um, and I mean, I think everybody here are you know well aware of that um, artificial intelligence is just simply sort of magnifying uh, or amplifying the the human bias that already exists, um, and uh, and then you know there is the issue of how can you how or what kind of values uh, do you program into your AI system to deal with the data? But then it's also the problem of dirty data, and how do you deal with that? Uh, and then it's the black box problem. So, so, and and that is the problem where you know it's very, very hard, and in some cases, pretty much impossible even for the computer scientists to really figure out what kind of process the the algorithms went through to get to the answer. So, so for me, um, you know, I I would consider myself to be sort of a you know tech nerd uh, to some extent, but to see that, you know, already before we have solved these like basic problems with artificial intelligence, we are already just implementing systems into our society. And 
while we were re releasing the film, I, you know, I human here in Norway uh, earlier this year, we had a lot of special events uh, with the Norwegian department that was uh, creating the, the Norwegian AI strategy. Uh, and in this process, we always, uh, we always had, we also had screenings with the Norwegian uh, police and security um, uh, intelligence agencies, um, as well as the data uh, science uh, board. And one of the problems that, you know, we, we sort of were able to really discuss very openly, which I'm, I'm really kind of impressed and grateful for, is that the, the, like the police force, for example, they're giving a, given a mandate by the government to go out there and find the most efficient, cheapest and best AI systems out there. And when it comes to, you know, policing, uh, for example, the, the cheapest systems come from places like China, Israel or the US. So here in Norway, the police ended up buying, uh, you know, a, a version of Palantir, which comes out of the, the post 9-11 climate uh, and was created by Peter Thiel, who is a very close friend of Trump, uh, comes from a very sort of right wing perspective. Uh, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, but, but one of the issues that we are facing, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that this also counts in, in Scotland, uh, and in many, many countries uh, around the world is that the, the cheapest, most efficient systems often are built on very different values and on dirty data sets that we can't really control. So in some ways, uh, what we learned from our release here in Norway is that our governments have sort of given up some control to, to private actors. Um, and I really believe that if we are going to solve this, we actually have to start investing more money into creating our own AI systems uh, that will protect our dem democratic values and to ensure uh, that you know we at least get as close as possible to uh, to uh, enforcing democracy. That's a really good point, and and actually brings me to uh, I think one of the kind of immediately kind of pertinent limitations that a, a Scottish strategy may have, which is that it's operating not in isolation. It's not just gonna be buying from a good Scottish company. It's gonna have, like you said, com com competitors from various parts of the world where um, you're not quite sure where the ethics entered or what data they used. So kind of with that in mind, it was a question that I, I uh, thought of for Shannon, which was, whether Scotland could operate an ethical AI strategy in an environment where AI is often developed by a company or a country with a different set of values, ethics, or even, as Tony put it, sometimes a lack of ethics at all. Well, I think a couple of things. So um, first of all, I do think that uh, although it's a challenge, the responsibility uh, that nations have to their to their publics uh, is, is non-negotiable. And so uh, the, the Scottish government, like all governments, is, is morally obligated to do what it can to protect its citizens uh, uh, from harm, uh, from uh, uh, discriminatory and unjust treatment. Um, and there's a lot that governments can do uh, to, uh, to implement that. Uh, but there's no question that there are some, some barriers and limitations there. Um, and that's why I, I really insist upon not treating these as mutually exclusive alternatives, like either governments regulate um, or we have to rely on industry to, to self-regulate. We need both. It's not going to work uh, by choosing one path over the other. Uh, it only works if government does what it can and industry does uh, what it must. Um, and that requires some of this professional transformation that several of my panelists have been talking about uh, which uh, I, I agree, um, I, Tonya mentioned it, uh, is already starting within the industry. Uh, there is this, this growing um, sophistication and, and uh, moral awareness of the responsibility uh, of data professionals, of AI researchers. And uh, at risk again of being provocative, I think one of the things we have to 
pay attention to is how much AI researchers are doing themselves to establish scientific standards and professional standards for the research uh, that they uphold internally. Um, and the kind of research that was being described there is widely uh, considered uh, unscientific in uh, mainstream AI research communities today. It's phrenology. It, it's, it's a pile of skull calipers drenched, dressed up in an AI trench coat. Uh, this stuff was discredited in the 19th century when we were measuring people's skulls and predicting whether they would be criminals by the shape of their skulls and faces. It was empirically and scientifically discredited research. And the research that's been doing, that's been revitalizing this with AI has largely been in, in all cases I'm aware of, uh, pretty, pretty robustly discredited as well. So for example, you know, uh, the studies that were uh, claiming to be able to predict criminality from facial uh, analysis, uh, those studies uh, turned out to be doing things like uh, using data sets where all of the uh, criminals photos were taken by a special kind of camera, the kind of camera that's used to take mug shots. And even if you crop the same size photo, and even if you, you know, uh, adjust for brightness, there are still these subtle differences that the computer uh, picks up. So what's happening is that you think you've built a criminality detector from facial traits, and what you've built is a mug shot detector. Uh, and so the people who go in and look at these studies and show their scientific uh, flaws are the AI researchers themselves who have that expertise and that sense of responsibility. So I think going back to government, one of the things that government needs to do is partner with the experts that it has access to in universities, uh, in the third sector, wherever uh, in internally, uh, its own experts, but to draw on that broad expertise that lives in the AI industry and say, what's real, what's beneficial, what's safe, because yes, of course, sometimes AI researchers themselves get it wrong, but we have to actually respect that there's a lot of expertise there and increasingly a lot of awareness of what are legitimate uses of this technology. And a lot of legitimate AI researchers won't touch this phrenology garbage right now um, for very good reason. And so I think the, you know, we wanna distinguish legitimate AI research that's, that really can advance science and be beneficial. Like think about DeepMind's uh, release just a couple of weeks ago of the advance in uh, solving the, the scientific challenges around protein folding uh, that underlie diseases like uh, Alzheimer's uh, and, and Kreutz, uh, uh, Jacob and these other diseases that are really, really devastating to human uh, uh, well-being. We can use AI to make huge advances in some of these things. Uh, but you have to have experts who know the difference between garbage AI and, and, and genuinely safe, responsible, and scientifically sound AI. I'm still muted. Uh, I was curious about that same thing of like, it goes back to your point earlier around the kind of us buying, I guess, the godlike um, advertising. Like, is it, is there a lack of, I mean, I instinctively say like, get these things out into the public and trust that the public can like take and look through and, and find the kind of things that they can trust or, or critique and, and kind of explore themselves. But is there, has there been a kind of problem where we've sort of collectively just accepted these guys, these guys, predominantly guys are very smart. They probably know what they're talking about. And we just don't challenge enough. And, and also that maybe our media enjoys the kind of titillation of saying, you know, this thing knows how, whether you're homosexual or not. That's right. The media picked up that research. It wasn't promulgated by the wider AI community as a great discovery, quite the opposite. It was the media that picked up that research. Uh, and also, again, you know, this is where the, the professional responsibility has to play a pretty heavy role because it's really true. The public can't tell the difference between a, a claim from a Stanford researcher that's legitimate and a claim from a Stanford researcher that isn't. They see a professor of computer science at Stanford and hey, I guess that's right. Uh, and so we need to be able to raise the professional standards so that the uh, industry and the uh, academic uh, dimensions of the profession are self-regulating to the extent that they can. Again, that's not to pose that as a, a solution that obviates the need for, for states to regulate as well. 
but it's a different kind of regulation. It's the kind of regulation that uh, medical professionals do, right? Medical professionals in the 19th and 20th century, in order to keep public trust, also legal professionals, had to develop internal codes of practice and ethics that were self-enforced uh, within the community so that there was a clear line between quackery and medicine so that uh, those who were legitimate leaders in the profession could be recognized as such and you know, be able to earn the public trust even though the public is not in a position to determine whether this thing in a bottle with a, with a scientific looking label is poison or cure. You, you don't tell the public, hey, sip this and tell us if it killed you, right? You have to have experts. Uh, who hold the kinds of standards that are necessary. So you need transparency, but you cannot put all the weight, you cannot responsibilize individuals or groups who are vulnerable in the public to protect themselves. Uh, that's partly the job of states and it's partly the job of uh, the scientific community. I think we're getting a piano recital now as well, <laughs> potentially. <laughs> Um, um, I, wanted to, I wanted to turn to, to actually one of the areas where um, I think Karen kind of pointed to, or actually no, it's about a lot of us pointed out to this, is that AI is not kind of distributed equally. Um, it's often the kind of sharp edge of this sits at um, public sector, in, particularly in a really, really good book that I recommend other people picking up in Automating Inequality by Virginia Eubanks, is this focus on um, US um, uh, states often there to deliver kind of social security aid, adopting technologies that would be kind of seen as social sorting and, and, and kind of deliberations to decide whether or not a person's entitled to a kind of, um, uh, to a kind of, well, to a benefit. Um, the vast majority of us on this panel and, and often probably in the, the crowd as well will not have to experience something like that. Our AI is basically the kind of attempts to personalize content on, on us. We're not at the kind of sharp edge there, but Scotland's national performance framework, which is the kind of underpinning of the, um, the AI strategy, one of the 11 kind of uh, goals within the AI strategy, asks to try and use AI to create a more fundamentally more equal society. But if we look at it, AI is often used in ways that are kind of just unequal. It's, in, it's introduced unequally, it's distributed unequally. Um, so is it ever possible that it can contribute to uh, equality outcomes. And I was hoping that, that Karen might be able to kind of come in on that. I know you might have to speak over a piano recital. Though. Yeah, uh, sorry, I think the piano recital's going from my nine-year-old. I, I am plugged in, didn't realise you could still hear the piano, but never mind. Um, so I just want to emphasise the problem of how one frames a problem. And this is and Shannon has addressed this partly by looking at the quackery that we've seen in, in using faces to try and forecast criminality. One of the current problems I see at the moment is what I call the digital enchantment. So what we can currently do with machine learning is we can take data from existing phenomena and we can use that data to build a forecasting tool. And so what we're seeing at the moment is, you know, let's forecast the next person who is going to, to buy something. And that's enormously valuable to commercial operators. But one of the real dangers, once we move into the messy social world, and particularly the governmental domain, there becomes a tendency to focus on trying to build predictors, to build lovely sparkly forecasting tools, which say, let's find the next abuser of domestic violence, or let's find the next person who's going to commit a crime. Or even better, the EU is working on or thinking about building the next forecasting tool of forced migration. Oh, fabulous. And what are you going to do once you've found them? This is the problem that is not being addressed. There is an assumption that the fault lies with the individual and that the appropriate policy response should be to do something to that individual, particularly in the crisis space. Let's lock them up or let's try and anticipate and neutralize them in some way instead of thinking Let's apply our powerful tools for knowledge gathering to understand the foundational social problem that is going on here. What is it that leads to 
a propensity for domestic violence? What is it that we can do to help people who are in vulnerable situations? But of course, these are not questions that the technical community is trained to answer. And so the answer is, well, we, that's not for us. That's outside our jurisdiction. We can just build the predictive tools. And this is why, if we're going to use these tools powerfully to benefit society and in a more egalitarian matter, manner, we must have proper and integrated conversations with the social scientists and the humanities researchers to understand the messy nature of our social world and to realize that there are no magic bullets, yeah? Humanity is messy. That's part of what we celebrate about us. But it means that there aren't magic bullets and building a forecasting tool will not solve our social problems. So this is one thing that I think is particularly invidious that I see in the public sector, that there is this obsession for building a forecasting tool to predict the next X without any serious investment into understanding the nature of the underlying social structural problem that's going on. So I really want to exhort the Scottish community to really think hard about how we're framing the problem that we want our data-driven solutions to address before jumping in and building another forecasting tool. So in that sense, I think there is real potential to think about building um, systems that can help move us towards more egalitarian outcomes, but they won't be quick and they won't be easy and they will require hard integrated research on a sustained basis. And none of that's sexy. That's just not sexy to the tech world. That doesn't get the headlines like that. Oh, if we could just predict, you know, whether someone was gay from looking at the shape of their face. That's the stuff that gets headlines, that gets funded. And I think I'm afraid to say we need to do the slow, painful, serious research into understanding our, our society if we really want to use these tools to the to the benefit of the public in ways that are more egalitarian and inclusive. And, and that's not a very palatable claim, I'm afraid. Nobody wants to do that. It's not, it's not instant, it's not shiny, but I'm afraid I think that's really what we have to do if we want to get the best out of these technologies. I mean, that's great. And it's beginning to get into these really practical questions of what is the steps that one should take? What is it that, where should money flow um, and, and where should resources go towards? Um, which kind of brings me to the sort of final question in, in this little section, which is directed at, at Gillian, who's you know, been involved uh, really significantly in, in helping to even begin the idea of Scotland having an AI strategy. That, that idea, I believe, came from a, a data lab, kind of data lab uh, folks over at Data Lab. Um, so I kind of wonder with that in mind, when you've been going through this process and, and considering it from your own kind of multidisciplinary like area and having worked in business and things like that, what if there's one practical um, step that you think this strategy could take in its next phase, um, whether that could be any of the things that Karen was, was kind of uh, expanding on there, um, what do you think that would be? What would, I mean, you, you do have the year of the Scottish government, um, but I guess, so I'm keen to hear what you think is practically coming next. It's very kind of you to say, Matthew, but I'm not sure it's 100% <laughs> accurate, um, much like many AI algorithms. But uh, I probably just before I come to the, to the one action or activity, and, and I'll probably take a, a complete liberal stab at that and actually have three. But, but before I come to that, one of the things I wanted to, to share was that um, even though the strategy itself is not published, you know, there's there's ongoing work. And, and in fact, recently, Scottish Government and, and Police Scotland announced a brand new CivTech, CivTech challenge where they were inviting collaborators from industry, from startups, from academia to collaborate on the strategic challenge of developing ethical, explainable AI for the public sector in a way which can be repeated and scaled across multiple users. And the second part of the challenge was a specific Police Scotland um, ethical and explainable AI use case. And it wasn't about the prediction piece. It was actually about the very mundane piece, which was really interesting that Karen covered this. And it was around processing and analysis of unstructured data sets that would create operational efficiency such that actually they can free up resources to go and focus on frontline activities. And so that's where our police and, and government are starting. And they're doing so via an open call via the, the CivTech challenge process, which is fantastic because that probably brings me to the first thing that first couple of things that I think are really important um, on answering your specific questions about what activity. 
I think there's three. First is create specific actions in the strategy. Set out the first 100 days, the first year, the first two years. What does it mean? Um, what is going to be delivered? Uh, and, and move from a, a document that might sit in a drawer to something that is actioned. Um, and then holding the teams responsible for that to, to bring them to bear. The second thing is collaboration. So none of those actions should be, and the Scottish government should do this, and the Scottish government should do that. Um, it should be about actually, it's it's bigger than just one entity. And and back to the sheer principles of what we're trying to do with the AI strategy is, is make it work for our citizens, put people at the heart of it, uh, and again address that question of how do we want to live as a country and as a society. And we'll only ever do that if we collaborate. And then the third part is is reiterate. So it's not something that's set in stone and, and that's set for five years. So it's a kind of cycle of actions, collaboration and reiteration. Um, technology is moving at pace uh, that, you know, if we can just imagine what we've gone through in the last few years in terms of uh, political upheaval, um, Brexit, COVID, my goodness. Um, so, so the reiteration part, I think, is, is also key. So I'm going to take liberty and have three actions, collaborate and reiterate. Fantastic. I'll give you, I'll allow you for three. I'm not going to make you knock them off. That's fine. Um, uh, while I set up the, the final clip and then we're going to turn to, to the audience, I had a, a question for Amy because you know, as part of Think Films work on this, you've shown, like you said at the top, you've shown this to various policymakers um, around the world. Um, um, what do you think the impact has been on something like a human, but more generally, have you got a sense of where kind of wider policymakers are, are thinking on this? Is it purely economic? Are they taking in the ethical considerations? Are they embracing the challenge or are they just seeing it as a problem to be kind of um, uh, dealt with until somebody else comes along with a better idea? Oh, you're muted. So I'll also let Tonya come in on this because, you know, obviously this is her journey um, and her film. And um, but from our position as Think Film, what we've seen the biggest change is a real shift towards uh, a human centred approach to regulation. Um, uh, and that, you know, the conversation, particularly at a European level, really has shifted we, over the course of the film. And this is a sort of two year process that we've been involved with iHuman. Um, and, and during that time, you know, there's lots of other factors and dynamics in play as well. But what we've seen through iHuman is that that particularly has had an impact in changing how policymakers are talking about regulation and talking about keeping the humans at the center. Um, and so that's, and, and, you know, that's where regulation is now. It's all looking and there's, there's much of a bigger focus on fundamental rights um, and on how um, we can think about putting um, human rights, human values, human identity back at the centre of this technology uh, and, and getting back into the driving seat so that we're we're shaping society and not letting technology shape us and shape society as well. Um, so that's what I would say is, has been the biggest um, way that I humans entered the conversation. Um, I'll let Tonya add a few words as well from her perspective. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I totally agree with you, Amy. I, um, for me personally, it's been um, quite remarkable to to talk to different governments and different policymakers uh, within the uh, EU. Uh, right when they are kind of shaping, uh, you know, their standards for the new regulations that they are working on. Um, and also just seeing that, you know, because one, one of the, the, the biggest dangers with AI is that it is developing so incredibly fast. And the, the policy system and the bureaucracy that usually surrounds uh, the institutions that have to come up with the uh, international regulations moves very slowly. Uh, so to actually uh, to, to be part of conversations and, and also see that there are amazingly beautiful humans that are at the core of making the international regulations, uh, that is making me very, very hopeful. Great. That's really encouraging. Although I think I'm about to set up another pretty, not discouraging, but another pretty uh, challenging clip. So even though Tanya just reached for the positivity there, uh, let's dive in here. And, and every uh, everyone watching, um, 
uh, this we're about to head into moderated discussions if you have any questions for the panels you've got like kind of multiple ways to drop them in we've got folks on youtube facebook and slido and um, and we'll hopefully pick up a couple of them uh, your questions after this so um we'll drop in for the final clip just now artificial intelligence evolves at a very crazy pace you know it's like progressing so fast in some ways, we're only at the beginning right now. You have so many potential applications. It's a goldmine. Since 2012, when deep learning became like a big game changer in the computer vision community, we were uh, one of the first to actually adopt deep learning and apply it in the field of computer graphics. A lot of our research is funded by government, military, intelligence agencies. The way we create these photoreal mappings, usually the way it works is that we need two subjects, a source and a target, and I can do a face replacement. One of the applications is, for example, I want to manipulate you know, someone's face saying things that he did not. It can be used for creative things, for funny content, but obviously, can also be used for just simply manipulate videos and generate fake news. This can be very dangerous. You know, if it gets into the wrong hands, uh, it can get out of control very quickly. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. It may sound basic, but how we move forward in the age of information is going to be the difference between whether we survive or whether we become some kind of fucked up dystopia. So again, laying pretty bare um, the forms of challenges that, that we're seeing. Um, and actually, so kind of turning to look at the audience questions, um, a lot of the pieces that, that people have been bringing out are quite similar areas to what we we talked about. And interestingly enough, it's not always, you know, the questions haven't actually gone straight into something like regulation. Um, they've touched on the kind of structural questions that I think each of you have drawn upon. Um, one one I wanted to pick up on was um, recruiting females, or at least let's say uh, building more diverse computer science courses um, is a big problem. Um, so the person, the, the contributor asks, what what can schools do to help encourage girls, or let's say you know again encourage more diversity um, into AI higher education? And is that the kind of is that the more sustainable solution? For, from other folks' perspective than just say, let's let's regulate and create laws um, and instead kind of thinking much more about, you know, structurally in that in that regard um, and leave it open to the floor who's interested to jump in. Yeah, I'll, I'll come in, Matthew. I think um, there fundamentally needs to be a shift uh, in terms of these subject areas. Uh, and, and I don't know if anyone had also read Mark Logan's report earlier this year in Scotland, reviewing Scotland's tech ecosystem, which didn't 
kind of drill down in data and AI, but more holistically, the, the whole ecosystem. Uh, and his number one recommendation is around education. Uh, and um, we not only have a huge diversity challenge here in Scotland, but we also have a very fastly dwindling number of anyone taking computing science, um, which is a real challenge for our tech ecosystem as a whole. Uh, and he made a number of really significant recommendations about the importance of the subject, the importance of uh, reviewing the curricula, the importance of involving industry expertise in terms of teaching and, and co-creation of curricula that's relevant, exciting and fun. Um, and that applies both to boys and to girls and to a diverse audience. So I think we, we unfortunately, we have a bit of a tougher not, not only a diversity problem, but a, a problem more broadly that I think needs addressed. Additionally, there are some amazingly wonderful teachers out there. Tony Scullion comes to mind who, who runs Dress Code, um, a charity now to encourage diversity into uh, courses in schools. Um, and she and her team and, and groups are, are doing what they can, but fundamentally it does need a, a rethink. I think there's another role for other um, diverse role models to, to showcase that actually it's not about sitting in your slippers in a dark room coding. It's about sitting in your slip, slippers in a dark room on Zoom calls. Only kidding. Um, but uh, actually, there's there's hugely, you know, interesting uh, roles. Um, and I think f for AI specifically, I think the role of social scientists, humanit humanitists, and um, we're actively encouraging um, students from lots of different backgrounds. Law, I mean, the law profession is going to get be disrupted massively from the use of technology. How do we take some of that fantastic female talent in law and actually, you know, take them through a different pathway through a master's or through other uh, online um, uh, CPD and, and other training that actually broadens their horizon to, to come from different backgrounds and actually be at the forefront of the creation of this technology in the future. Um, and it I, you know, it wasn't me that said it, but there's other groups have said, you know, if your team is not diverse, then by default, your algorithm is biased. Well, I think that's a, we're running, we're running low on time. So that's potentially a great point to, to wrap up on. Um, uh, I think from our perspective at Think Film, you know, everyone needs to be part of the conversation. Um, this is what we're really encouraging is, is for people, for everyone who's watched iHuman to get involved and be part of changing the society. I mean, iHuman is meant to provoke debate and discussion. Um, it shows some very controversial viewpoints, but these are viewpoints being expressed by people inside the industry who are building this technology, who are teaching it to their students in academic settings and who are um, who are doing things in secret um, that we, we don't even know about. Um, and so, you know, we've talked about democratizing the debate and that's really what we want um, as Think Film. So um, thank you to everyone that's participated um, and for more action for what you can do as, a, as an audience member and as a citizen um, in Scotland and wherever you are, we'd really encourage you to visit um, tfip.org forward slash iHuman dash action. Um, and you'll see there some suggestions that we have as well as of things that you can do to be part of the change and to be part of building um, a, a better digital world. And from Scotland's perspective, um, as, as Gillian had said, Scotland's AI strategy has gone some gone through some form of consultation, but there's going to be more. Uh, there's efforts to try and continue and maintain this conversation. This event is, you know, a commitment from Open Rights Group to, to try and hold that space open as well. Um, and as we go into 2021 and start to think about what this looks like, um, we're really keen to make sure that this uh, is not just a one-off Zoom call, um, that we get everybody else back in their slippers some other time um, and <laughs> contributing, catch up on how Karen's uh, daughter's piano is getting on, um, everything. But it's, it's really important that these are not just like small stops along the way, that this is the beginning of uh, or just a one-off. It's, it's, it's something that kicks things in and you're more than welcome for not having anything to do with digital rights or anything to do with machine learning or artificial intelligence, that's actually the best thing that we could hear um, is if you've come to this from no perspective at all, just to understand. That's really where we need to be going now um, and including more and more people uh, in that journey because ultimately this is these strategies are um, 
are going to be brought in. They need to be bought in a way by the by the public. They need to be understood. We need to embrace them, um, and they'll only be done if they reflect what the public's uh, wants, desires, and and address their concerns as well. So um, use your voice. Um, join Open Rights Group as well, sign up. We'll, we'll do our best to try and keep you in, in the loop on where things are going on this. Um, but it, it, it leaves me there, not much time left to say, but thank you so much to each of our panelists. Thank you to Tonya for putting together iHuman and, and putting, it, putting in the effort to, to try and bring this um, uh, this documentary to, to, our, to our lives. Um, to Gillian, Shannon and Karen for just awesome insight into like such a wide variety of perspectives and um, tackling not just the regulatory aspects but the social structures that we have to engage with as well and also to Amy and Think Film Impact for kind of basically coming up with the idea to put this on and we're just like lucky to 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 be able to to work with each and every one of you guys um so yeah um so from my perspective this is the last thing I'm doing before Christmas so I'm going to take the opportunity to wish folks a Merry Christmas and happy seasons greetings and, and things like that. Enjoy it safely. Um, and um, yeah, we'll see you. I'll see you guys in the new year. And, uh, you know, let's keep on debating. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. you all. Take care.